Mr. Chairman, we're in public session. Hey, good morning, everybody. Uh, this is uh, August 8th, Commission on Public Ethics. Uh, we're going to start with approval of the minutes from the last public session on June 27th. In attachment A, I have a motion, please. So moved. Thank you. Commissioner McCall is going to Second. Again. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. For the second. Aye. Commissioner Weissman. Thanks. All in favor? Oh. <laughs> you didn't know that, did you? <laughs> All in New York City. <laughs> All in Albany. And Buffalo. All of Buffalo. <laughs> <laughs> All of Buffalo. Commissioner <laughs> <laughs> Any, any opposed? Uh, report from staff, item three on the agenda. Um, Steve, just, to, just quickly the first uh, quarter financial report. Sure, thank you. Uh, the enacted appropriation this year was for personal service, 4682000 and non-personal service, 900000 for a total of 5582000 That was the same as last year. The cash targets, uh, personal service, four million six hundred twenty thousand, nine hundred thousand, nine hundred eleven thousand uh, for non-personal service. For the first quarter, we spent one million two hundred forty thousand nine hundred sixty-four dollars on personal service, which is uh, approximately twenty-seven percent of our non-personal service <coughs> cash ceiling. For non-personal service, we spent one hundred forty-eight thousand. Divvied up in uh, approximately nine thousand for supplies, six thousand for equipment, five thousand for travel, and one hundred twenty-seven thousand for contractual services, and that made up sixteen point three percent of our cash target for NPS. So total spending for the first quarter was one million three hundred eighty-nine thousand thirty-four dollars, or twenty-five point one percent of our budget. Any questions? Thank you. Yeah, uh, Commissioner Weissman has. Oh, I'm sorry. Is this this is the first time? Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. That we're actually going to spend out our appropriation if these numbers hold correct. Well, this this was uh, kind of a different year. Uh, we had two two percent cost of living increases for MC represent uh, MC designated employees, uh, and a two percent MC parity increase. That's why they were paid in the first quarter, April and June. And that's why the uh, personal service is exceeding what we think it should be, you know, time frame wise. I talked to the Division of Budget. Uh, we may be going over our appropriation and cash targets. They are aware of that. A lot of agencies are in the same boat. They just haven't come up with a resolution uh, on how they're going to accomplish it. Just to explain, though, those 2% parity increases, one was retroactive that's to April of 2016. Yes. So this reflects payroll that is was actually accrued in 2016, but they didn't make them effective until this summer. And then the other one was retroactive to April 1. So all the agencies are facing this additional financial burden this year. And the parity increase was for uh, an increase that uh, unionized uh, employees received in the past. MC designated people did not. So we're aware of personal services over budget as we go right now. And uh, again, many agencies are going to be in the same boat. They're going to uh, exceed their cash and appropriation. And it's up to uh, Division of Budget will give us more guidance as we go along. Okay, thank, you. thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Um, Mr. Chair, I'll do the update on outreach activities. Um, a few uh, items of note. Um, we have posted a spring-summer edition of the newsletter and guidance uh, on the website. Um, an ethics letter has also gone out um, regarding threshold filers. It's a, it's a work in prog progress. Um, we have those raises, and there's going to be an impact on who files and who should have filed. But that's that's being worked out right now. Um, our education unit has also put a fall training schedule online, so all FTS filers who need training can sign up. 
And um, also, uh, JCOPE, as mentioned earlier, in earlier meetings, will be holding its first ethics conference October 26th uh, in New York City. Um, we've sent a save the date to the agency ethic officers and general counsels. Um, there is CLE credit that we'll be giving. We, there is a draft book. It's going to be the first. It'll be a softbound book. Uh, bound to make the bestseller list. Uh, it's about uh, the history and background on ethics and lobbying regulation in New York. Um, we're going to distribute the books as part of the conference itself. Um, we're going to have, there'll be three panels. The first panel will have as a keynote speaker um, uh, Richard Rifkin, uh, who's the senior counsel at the State Bar Association and a former director of one of our, this agency's predecessors. And we're going to have uh, other panel discussions on um, post-employment, and um, I think, in, is it investigations that we're looking at? Or, Monica, do you recall the other topic? Yes, yes. The other topic is inve investigations investigation. and procedures so we're gonna, and coordinating with other agencies. And we hope this is a start of the agency doing more outreach <coughs> to, uh, to practitioners uh, and the public um, uh, in these areas. So it should be, should be pretty good. So uh, we'll have those. When those reminders, when those uh, announcements are, are firm, are more firm in terms of content, um, it, it'll be uh, obviously distributed to the commissioners as well. So um, that's set up to go. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, item four, regulation. Um, I'll, I'll just, Bobby. I will introduce just introduce these. Um, the first are comprehensive lobbying regulations. Um, these are the regulations that, in, in, that have been um, first put out by the commission, the staff put out on behalf of the commission many months ago. We've been eliciting uh, and uh, getting uh, extensive public comment. A lot of those changes have been incorporated. Um, there were some changes made since our last meeting. Um, reflecting uh, the very generous input by commissioners here as well. Um, we're at the stage now, um, if I can suggest to the commission, um, where we need more comment, but through the SAPA process, um, so that these regulations, as drafts, are posted in the, in the, in the state register. Um, it's going to be a process that will involve, once again, getting comment, um, give and take, um, through the commission, with the commission, <coughs> indicated that another public hearing uh, as well. Um, and then I would anticipate that if there are other, there will be feedback and other changes, it will probably come back again to the commission for a further period of comment. So what we're asking for today uh, is um, to commence this period of comment under the SAPA process. By so doing, the commission is um, uh, really opening it up more, opening it again to the public. It is not putting its imprimatur on um, every word, comma, and, um, and other issues that have been discussed, but it does enable the public to uh, have their comments published, uh, the, the various statements that have to be produced. Uh, summarizing those comments under SAPA would be produced. We've been doing that voluntarily. Uh, the commission has been really uh, outstanding on doing that on its website. Um, but I, I think it's, it's, it'd be interesting to see these, how these fly once they leave the nest a little bit. Um, and by starting the SAPA process now, we're enabling that process to continue. Um, so um, I'm asking for the commission to uh, vote to commence the SAPA process with respect to the uh, uh, comprehensive lobbying regulations which appear in attachment B. Uh, how long is the uh, comment period? 45 days for the initial and then after substantive review, a 30-day period for each substantive change. And that comes back to us after the first 45 days? Correct. That's right. There's no adoption. You're, there's no formal adoption of the commission after 45 days. And these are not emergency regs, so they're not... They don't have any force of law um, uh, or force of guidance, as it were, in, in this case. And, and we fully anticipate that these are going to be subject to some revision um, 
there's a lot in here. This is the first time the agency has done this. Um, there are really important concepts in here which we have been modifying as we go along. So we, we anticipate there'll be multiple rounds, um, and we just want to kick it off and get it started. And I, I just want to add the, and they will come back to the commission at each stage and for final adoption. And the commissioners, the I have to tell you, from a staff standpoint, I, I'd like to thank the commissioners for spending time and giving input on it. I mean, this is ultimately going to be a product of the, of the commission, should they ever be adopted. Um, and this will also permit that for those further comments and, co and uh, interaction between the commissioners and, uh, and, and the public um, and uh, the, the stakeholders who are really the public in, in lobbying, um, but, but those who participate actively in the lobbying process as well. I think having a, another public hearing, and I'd suggest that it, if we do that, if we do it in Albany this time. We did one in the city. We could do one up in Albany. Uh, we'll also add to the, um, uh, the transparency in this process, and it's been very transparent in a very positive sense since, since this started. Commissioner Jacob is, uh, would like to speak. Are comments still in order by commissioners? Comments are always in order by that. They're always in order by the commissioners. So if you were, in, I mean, I think what we I'd were. I'd like to ask just one question. Sure. That's why I, I raised. If you look at page pages 38 to 39, which is the fee schedule Got it. or the penalty schedule for late filing, the bi monthly report. And there is a difference between first time and all other filers. And it would seem to me that at the very least, when you get down to 181 days and more and more, there should be no difference. Whether you're a first time filer, I mean, you gotta get your big boy pants on, so to speak. <laughs> You've been in the business, and you're now late six months or more, we ought not to be giving a break even to a first-time filer. There's a... That, that's a comment I have for us to consider before it's put out. I mean, one could argue they should get no break at 91 days. But I'm going to the last item. Page. 181 days or more, there is simply no excuse to reduce the penalty. For a first-time file, Martin. Just, Martin just well, I assume the difference. I assume the difference uh, between a first-time filer and a subsequent filer is we're assuming that the first-time filer is learning the procedures, learning that they need to file, um, and so whether they learn at a week or six months. I think the premise is still the same, which is they haven't figured out yet, you know, what the procedures are for Jacob. And after the first time filing, then you know, and there should be no break. So I think that principle is that's the basic premise um, behind a first time filer and a subsequent filer. I think that applies throughout. Uh, commissioners, just I understand your point, and. Uh... I don't agree, but I understand. Just something to be aware of. Um, the, uh, the statute limits the penalty for a first-time filer to $10 a day, while a non-first-time filer can be assessed up to $25 a day. So at 181 days, um, we'd be, be limited to $1,810 for a first-time filer. That said, we you know set it at a thousand dollars, but there is some room there. But I want to be clear that we are statutorily limited to a certain number, and this is the way we. Now approach. you created a bigger a bigger question in my mind because if the statute <clears throat> would create a a greater penalty when aggregating or totaling the daily fine, then why are we changing that? We're, we're just an agency, we implement the statute. We are now doing something that the statute doesn't even authorize us to do. I, I respectfully, Commissioner, the statute authorizes up to $10 a day or $25 a day. This commission and its predecessors going back years and years 
have used a set fee schedule based on the number of days late using ranges like it's in here. Um, what this does is take the existing schedule, uh, add one, a grace period for the first week, and two, increase the subsequent penalties so that after the grace period, uh, the penalties are a bit more severe, but we also provide a seven day out, if you will. So this is consistent with prior practice and I believe statutorily permissive. The up to does answer my 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 legal query, but uh, it it does demonstrate that from the standpoint of the statute, uh, the the legislature may have even contemplated more. But I don't understand the one thousand dollar flat late fee for a first time filer. Um, but if that staff approach. I disagree. I don't know whether that is put to a commission vote, and I, uh, I understand that Commissioner Smalls disagrees with that. But I think the statute gives greater force to my argument. C Commissioner, if, if, if I may, and I, and I think you make a, a good argument, um, that's part of what we're trying, what we'd like to get going here, is getting, it, getting this proposal out. Um, the, the commission okay. will get will get comments. Um, I am sure from uh, from good government groups, um, from other entities that are involved in this area uh, on this, and we can build, you know, to build a record. I, I think this is this is a way of defining within our discretion, within the commission's discretion, uh, what it can't do, or what it, what it will not do. So people have some there's some certainty there. But that's part of what we're trying to do is is kick it out, uh, and um, and. Uh, see where we go. No problem. Uh, Commissioner Cohen has a second. I don't have a comment. Before I move to, um, to for the commission to send this through the SAPA process, I just want to take a moment to uh, commend the staff and especially Martin for uh, what is an exceptional work product. I, I know from being a staff member myself and involved in the drafting of the source of funding regulations, which was an endeavor far, far more limited in scope. Um, it's it's a difficult undertaking, and I and I think the staff uh, deserves um, a, a great deal of credit and recognition for really the the exceptional efforts they've undertaken over the past year in the case for some of these regulations. And with that, I uh, I move that we um, I don't know what the precise language would be, but I move that we we Can submit these for the submit the regulations at tab B for the. Uh, to the SAPA process. I'll second. Two. Commissioner Deering is second. Who is the second? Commissioner Deering. Okay. In favor, please. Uh, right. Oh, excuse, oh, call for a vote. Yeah. New York City is in favor. Uh, Buffalo is in favor. I can't. I can't see all of Albany, Deb. Uh, yeah. Albany's all in favor. In favor. Yes. So we have all in favor in Albany as well. Okay. Are there any opposed? Thank you. Do you want to go to the next? Yes. Um, uh, source of funding regulations also have been similarly um, uh, placed out there. Um, they have been um, uh, subject to the same scrutiny as our, our lobbying regulations. Um, at this point, the idea is, once again, uh, we are continuing, in, in this case, we have our prior source of funding regulations in place. So we actually do have those in place. Uh, these are not emergency regs, once again, so there's no, uh, what we would be asking for is a motion simply to start the SAPA process on these areas. Uh, if there's a, a decision not to adopt them, we have source of funding regulations that are already there. Um, so um, uh, that's the uh, just uh, just Martin. one just one point to to let commissioners know the source of funding regulations the proposed changes from the existing regulations were drafted in conjunction with the proposed lobbying regulations that you just uh, approved for submission to the register so they do in essence go hand in hand um, not that they can't be done separately on different tracks but um, they were drafted with corresponding changes just. Keep that in mind. Yeah, there are conforming changes in terms of some of the, the language, such as client filer. There's some definitions there that refer back to 
refer back to these. Um, and that's why they've, they've ridden together through this process. But as Seth said, uh, uh, these are standard regulations without any emergency effect. Uh, may I, Mr. Chairman? Yes. Commissioner Levine. Uh, Martin, uh, the section dealing with exemption for a particular source of funding, if I'm reading this correctly, deletes <coughs> the evidentiary standard, also deletes the language substantial likelihood of harm. Could you elaborate? Commissioner, those changes... 16. Page, page 16 and 38.4. Uh, those what changes. page do you want? Martin, what page or what section? 17. 16. Page 16, 938.4. Yeah, but I think he's still going to Those changes were proposed to conform the language of the regulation uh, to the language of the statute word for word. Um, and. Well, that's my answer. Yes, but isn't, on the follow-up, Mark, yes. isn't the question invited? What evidentiary standard are we supposed to apply to these determinations? The question might be begged. You could make that argument. You know, there's, there's obviously a body of administrative case law that talks about what the dual default standards are, um, and that might be part of the discussion going forward. Um, but... Well, what is your response to the proposition that we can adopt any reasonable standard we deem appropriate? Um, well, first of all... I'm sorry, uh, Commissioner Levine, can you repeat the question? Please. Yes, the question is, given the fact that the statute does not enunciate an evidentiary standard, is it our prerogative to adopt one that is uh, reasonably within the ambit of the statute? Well, I wouldn't ever that deign to tell you matter. what you can and can't do. Well, fair enough, but as a practical matter, if we get one of these, what standard are we supposed to use? What does the staff recommend? So, um, Commissioner Levine, um, you know, this issue has come up from time to time. Um, I, I think, and we've, we've, we've discussed whether or not a st standard is even necessary. There is an argument that this is not really an evidentiary proceeding. It's, a, it's more of... Um, an administrative determination in the discussion of the commission and that an evidentiary standard is, is not required. But should the commission view it as needing an evidentiary standard, there's a range of evidentiary standards the commission could adopt. Um, and um, clear and convincing evidence was, was, was the high, one of the highest standards. That's not the typical standard that would apply in, um, in evidentiary proceedings um, under the SAPA. So there, there is a range, um, well, I, I, and, and we could discuss This is going them. out now for further comment. I, right, right. Exactly. I, I'll reserve the same way as Commissioner Jacob did on the prior subject. But this, 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 this deletion is objectionable to me. But let's see what the comment is. What's the deletion? The clear and convincing evidence. So it's in brackets, it's getting deleted. This is how you submit the regs when they go out and they get published in the state registers is how they will look. So what's in brackets is being deleted, what's in, it's the opposite of what you normally think. So what's being underlined is what's being added. I just don't see any brackets. Um, like, you will. Do you see clear and convincing, are you looking at 938.4? Okay, on 16. Okay. So if you, you could see that by clear and convincing evidence is being removed because it's not in the statute. Oh, and then may is being substituted for will because may is the statutory language and a substantial likelihood of, of is being removed because that is not the statutory standard. Let me suggest something because the, the, the okay. if, if I can, the point that's been raised by, uh, by, by Commissioner Levine and, and Martin responded to is, is, certainly, is certainly very important. Part of what we can do in this process um, 
is illicit comments from people in the area of administrative law. As, as Monica stated, I mean, one way of viewing, and I, these were discussions that took place before I came here, so I looked at these anew, but with a fairly good background in administrative law. To the extent this is just an administrative determination, there's a great deal of leeway the Commission has without a specified standard, as long as, as, as things are not, done, are not done in an arbitrary and capricious manner. There are, you know, that's one way of looking at it. The other way is, is setting it in something that's almost quasi-judicial and setting a standard um, which, um, um, which, is, which in this case is a, or currently a high standard and which will stay in place. But perhaps it's a good idea once we get these out there is to, is to get the comments from uh, some of those who, with, with, with expertise in administrative law to answer the question uh, and, uh, and uh, get that that brief to guide the Commission on whether um, it, it wants to remain with what the standard is and, and as Commissioner Levine said, that there is latitude in adopting that standard or um, perhaps the, the alternative that's, that's also suggested is also feasible. So as these go out, we'll make it a point to, 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 to get those comments. Uh, as, as I understand I it, may, may I? the chain, I'm sorry, may, I'm sorry. May I? I'm sorry. I, whoever. Let the chair call someone. Yeah, my, a chair, a, a, Commissioner Yates started talking, and then Commissioner Jacobs. And Commissioner I Jacobs. I yield. I yield. You yield. <laughs> he's he's yielding. <laughs> not, not before I yield. <laughs> uh, Commissioner Jacobs yields to Commissioner Yates. There we go. All right, go ahead. As I understand it, Martin, the change you're making here is to conform the language more to the statute as it exists, sure. and the old clear and convincing language that was in there actually went beyond the statute. It was, a, it was an additional hurdle that was put in that wasn't really clearly authorized by the statute. Whether it was authorized or not, your, your premise is correct. This is conforming back to the original statute. And, and, and the question raised by Commissioner Levine, which is the dividing point, is whether there is authority, whether it was authorized, whether, whether there is that ability. But I think that's something mm -hmm. that, that, that is certainly going to be addressed in the course of, of just moving these things through that process. But if I if I'm correct, the may relate to applications by 501c3. No, um, 501c3s are not covered under our statute. They're exempt okay, by law. So, so this, remember, this is all we're looking at is the provision for individual exemptions. So this is when, this is when a particular source is seeking to get an exemption, which just for the record, we've never had one of these applications yet. This is when a particular source, for whatever reason, doesn't want to be disclosed, and they will have to present evidence uh, that they may face harassment, harm, that's mine, I think, uh, okay. harassment, harm, or whatnot. Whereas what we typically have dealt with at the commission is the other class, which is the, the, the 501c4 Four. is seeking exemption for all its sources. And their the statutory language, the language yeah. is different and includes that they must show a substantial likelihood. Well, well, I was just going to point out that the May is, as Commissioner Yates points out, is statutory. Yes. And it shows a leniency because if you move all of the 501c4s on page 17, the word is will. Yes. And that too is statutory. That's correct. Now, between the may and the will, uh, there is a big difference. And it may also impact the, the standard of proof. So you say may as opposed to when you say will. Should the standard of proof be more lenient where the will or, or less lenient where the will is applied? So I think we need to focus on these where the, le the legislature made this, made this point by using may in one instance and will in another, and it may have an impact on the standard of proof in each instance. I, I think that's, if I may, Commissioner, I think it's exactly, exactly on, on point. Um, and just to reiterate, this has nothing to do with C3s. They're, they're in the Attorney General's ballpark, not ours. We I don't deal, we deal with them. I just want folks to be comfortable that we're not dealing with sources of C3s or filers who are C3s. We're in, the, we're in C4 land, not C3s, so that's not our, not our issue. Uh, Commissioner Weissman had his hand up, uh, Chairman Rose. Just, just quickly, I mean, this, what we're really dealing with is a long-term philosophical issue for this commission. Uh, Commissioner Renzi used to point out that the statute itself was designed for transparency, and yet the uh, 
the the issues that the commission faced was the application of the exemption and and trying to make sure that uh, that we met the transparency goals of the statute but met at the minimum requirements I think laid out by the United States uh, Supreme Court and some of its uh, at least one of its decisions in sort of pro protecting certain sources from uh, imminent threats or harm so that, that that's why for, for some of people sitting at this table today this this has been a continuing discussion almost from day one with these these mm -hmm. regulations may I uh, Commissioner Rosen, uh, Commissioner Levine is asked to be recognized. Uh, I want, uh, could we address for a moment Martin Appeals? This is a discussion that the Commission has had previously. Does the proposal in any way change the current appeals protocols, particularly as it relates to the Commission having the ultimate prerogative to make a determination? not the hearing officer. The reg makes no the proposed regulation makes no change to the appeal process. And as we previously had changed it, uh, all determinations by hearing officers are subject to our ultimate scrutiny, correct? Is that correct? In other words, the final determination going to the board? No, Martin, I think the individuals the go to a hearing officer. Oh, sure. The individuals it, 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 by statute, it is, I think, goes to a hearing officer. Martin, is that correct? Yes. Yep. That's how the reg reads. And uh, as we know, the prior iterations took away the appeal for the, uh, the umbrella applications. Yeah. Huh. So, so, Commissioner Levine, there is a distinction. Um, there is no appeal. Um, of the group exemptions, the ones that we normally deal with. The only way to appeal those is to bring an Article 78 to challenge it. But the individual exemptions by statute have the ability to be appealed to an independent hearing officer. And that does not come back to the commission. And that's by statute. And so the regs conform to the statute. And, right. our, and these proposed regs do not change that as they exist under current? Correct. Well, Monica, Correct. We you, just, I think we were just clarifying some of the language, but um, they don't, they, these regs do not change anything with respect to the appeal. Yes, would you please amplify, though, Monica, with respect to the obverse of what you just sketched? What is the prerogative of the commission to overturn a hearing officer determination in either appeal format? Well, he's asking, can we bring an action to challenge the hearing officer's determination if the hearing officer overrules the commission? The individual? He, I think what Commissioner Levine is asking, but Commissioner, speak for yourself, please, is whether or not if a hearing officer overturns the commission on an individual exemption, in other words, the commission denies the individual exemption and the hearing officer grants it, what recourse does the commission have? Yes, very, very eloquently stated, better than I did. No, I say, oh, thank you, but I think you're pretty clear. Uh, Seth, I mean, I, I, I would have to look at this. I think it would be unusual for us to bring the Article 78 to challenge the hearing officer. Well, yeah. Yeah. Commissioner yeah. Jering has had experience yeah. in, in the administrative <laughs> sense on this, so right. I... Right. Uh, so, um, I, I don't think you can... Uh, uh, it's basically the... Um, the hearing officer determination is a determination of Jacob, and I don't think you can appeal your own determination. So um, I, I don't think that would be available. I know that, um, for example, uh, with the state health department, there are times where um, hearing officers make determinations that um, the department or the commissioner uh, doesn't particularly like, and um, there's no ability to appeal that. Um, and I know that it sounds like there's a, a different statutory scheme here, but um, if the statute wasn't in, in the way, then obviously the, the hearing officer determination could be, in essence, an advisory. But um, absent that, I think it's a problem. And, it's, and, of course, it's the commission that makes the determination in, in, in its 
administrative sense to begin with. As, in, for example, the, as you said, the health department, there are situations where the Department of Health will make a determination. Someone will appeal it to a, some kind of JHO. It, it's not an unusual construct, but it's also the construct that currently exists under our, uh, under our current practice. So the appeals process is, is not, has not been altered. Um, I think in the, in the context of, of, of dealing with this appeal issue, and, and if a suggestion is made, it should be taken further. I think that's something that, um, you know, if, if it's going to be aired out in the public, it, it's it more, we're certainly giving, you could certainly have an opportunity, but I'm not sure, uh, you know, much else can do. We're certainly not changing what we're doing now. I'll belabor this for only 30 seconds more, and you can use a stop. <laughs> uh, I have a limited repertoire. I've said to the, uh, my colleagues before, and I want to reiterate here for emphasis, when we can, when it is within the bounds and ambit of the statute, we should preserve the prerogative of the commission to be the ultimate institutional determination body. That's it. Uh, Commissioner Yates, uh, Commissioner, uh, Chair Rosen has got his hand up. I'm, I'm sort of half agreeing with Commissioner Levine and half not. And <laughs> well, I'll, that take is, the, I'll take the one hand, <laughs> <laughs> Your Honor. And that is the idea of it boomeranging, boomeranging so that the commission makes a determination that a hearing officer says, no, you're wrong, and then the hearing, then the commission comes back and says, no, you're wrong, it seems a little difficult. But on the other hand, if the hearing officer, you know, violates the normal standards you apply to an arbitration proceeding, for instance, or something, you know, ignores the law or is biased or misapplies the law totally, then there should be some review. And it seems to me what you're saying is that the commission doesn't have standing to then bring an Article 78 or otherwise complain when the hearing officers really misapplied the law. And that's troublesome because you're going to get incon inconsistent results and maybe results that are way outside the statute. So that's why I'm half agreeing with you and half not. There should be some way that you can complain about a really off-the-wall determination by a hearing officer, but I don't think the solution is to just sit there and say, we didn't like what the hearing officer said, so we're overruling it. Um, I don't know. <laughs> Truth be told. Um, well, of course, the commission ha the commission has a, a few different recourses in that respect. If a hearing officer, I mean, not for that particular matter, but if a hearing officer is uh, not abiding by the law, we certainly could remove that hearing officer from our hearing officer pool going forward. Mm -hmm. um, and um, and I will remind everyone that the way that we generally apply these is that. If an exemption is granted, it's, ex it's, it's generally been a grant granted for one filing period, so the ramifications are short term. Um, although there, there, there might be an argument of some precedential value, I suppose, the next time they apply. And again, I'll just remind everyone, in the last five years, we've never had an individual application. Um, but if I so may. We, can, we, can, we can put this out and see what kind of comments we get. But that would be the worst of all results, and that is, you don't like what the hearing officer said, so you remove them uh, without litigating the issue. I mean, you don't want to go down that path. I, I, I'm a, I'm, yeah. I, meant, I meant remove them from our pool for the future so that we yeah. wouldn't... Well, we the pool right now is fairly future. small, yeah. so <laughs> it's a waiting pool. Yeah, well, we have about, <laughs> right, we have seven, but um, and that's something we're going to work on, but I'm, I'm just saying that um, if the commissioners felt that a hearing officer wasn't performing under the, you know, uh, performing properly, then then the commission can, you know, revise the hearing officer pool for the next election. Uh, actually, Jim, to your comment, um, not in the context of the exemption, but we did have a situation where a hearing officer came down with a decision, and while we agreed basically with the decision, we thought he got a piece of the, piece of his decision was just wrong on the law. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and, and we stated as such. So how did you deal with it? Uh, when, when we issued the decision, when, when it came back to us, we noted 
that uh, the hearing officer... We modified. Yeah, we modified. The, the hearing officer effectively and, missed the boat. On, on the and statute. that was in the context of a public officer's law violation where the hearing officer came back and, and the commission fulfilled its function and yeah. corrected the law in that situation. And there was a mechanism, I mean, that was... Because the commission was the final arbiter also yeah. in that case. So you're saying you'll, you let the hearing officer be the final word on the facts but you always reserve for the commission the interpretation of the law. law. Yes, in that particular instance. It's, it's a different statute, too, uh, Jim. And that's, under, a, that's a statutory process. That's the, exa yes. that's the executive law 94. Uh, that's different than the, under the, I mean, that's dealing with uh, under subdivisions 13 and 14 um, of uh, executive law 94. These The lobbying act pr prescribes different procedures. It just seems to me that people are identifying a problem that's not particularly unique to any administrative body. Uh, whether you're with the JHO or you're with the courts, you may get a decision that you fundamentally disagree with and you think is absolutely 100% wrong. In the court system, you can go through the appeals process and you may be dissatisfied throughout that entire process and that's the end of it. But this is the statutory scheme we have and you're going to get, we may in fact get decisions that are, we disagree with, but that's the system of laws and the structure that we are living with right now. I don't really see how it's, this is any, a, a unique problem to this statutory scheme or to this agency. We, we, we trust that we get good but judicial hearing isn't, officers isn't. just like we trust we get good judges and occasionally they may make decisions we disagree with. But isn't the commission the final word in any event because we have the ability to issue opinions and, and state our views on issues that arise under the statute, so a, a hearing officer can take a position that may be wrong in one way or another, in our view, and we can, we, there is a corrective in, 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 in the way we operate. We can correct it. So I think we're, over, we're overemphasizing the impact of these individual applications of which we've had zero as Monica points out, and uh, the fact that they are very time limited. And so is the hearing officer. So I don't see this as, personally, I don't see it as a problem or certainly not as a major problem. We, I, I would like one. <laughs> I don't know what you like. You're the commissioner. <laughs> Chair, I... I you got a motion? <laughs> uh, uh, Chair, I make a motion to move, is this part 938, uh, for adoption for uh, SAPR rulemaking. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Commissioner Sample and Commissioner Jacobs also, say, uh, they both seconded on that. All in favor. New York's in favor. Albany's in Buffalo's favor. Buffalo's in favor. Sarah's in favor. Albany's in favor. Oh. Nobody Thank opposed, you. Mr. Chair. I'll do attachment D. Uh -huh. Mr. Chair, should I do attachment D? Um, these are slightly different. These are proposed regs, but I'm going to let Monica explain what, why we're doing right. these, since she's got the history and the background on that. Yeah. Um, so these are um, these are our, the commission's records access regulations. Um, shortly after I joined the commission, I think a week after I came in um, March or April of 2012 the commission amended the existing records access regulations in order to conform with JCOP statute with uh, public uh, with PIRA that was adopted in 2011. So the Commission on Public Integrity had records access regulations. JCOP amended them to conform with the statutes and we did that on an emergency basis and unfortunately we discovered a few months ago that th those changes were never made permanent. And so the regulations reverted to the version that the Commission on Public Integrity had in place. So we're coming back to the Commission to ask that you go ahead and adopt these on an emergency basis so they go immediately into effect and, and now conform with our statute and to move forward on a permanent basis 
so that this won't happen again. Um, you can see what the changes are, but like I said, mostly it is to properly name the agency, talk about substantial basis investigation reports, which wasn't in the preceding statute. And another difference that existed in JCOPE's regulations as compared to CPI's regulations was that um, our records access regulations provided for an appeal. So if someone seeks a record from our, uh, our records access officer, who is Walt McClure, and they want to challenge that, it, come, it comes to me or to the Deputy General Counsel, Martin, um, as an appeal. Um, and obviously from that appeal, then they can go to court. So far, I, I think over the course of the last five years, if we've had an appeal, it might have been just one. Um, for the most part, um, it, it's pretty clear. We're not subject to FOIL, so these just follow the statute as to what's publicly available. Yeah. And so we're asking for it. Yes, sir. Go ahead. May I comment? Please. Having been in the government for a number of years and, and having observed apart from that what goes on with requests of agencies to make available records, I think it is important and in the public interest that we not use vague terms. So over here, in 937.2, we have a provision in two, two small i. Make the record promptly available. Now what is in somebody's view promptly, in someone else's view, may be a lot less so. I think we ought to put in a time limit that this agency has this is a public record. People do have need for access. And I don't mind giving us 10 days, maybe even less, but promptly you ought to be out of it. So if I could, um, it refers to 937.3 and 937.4. And 937.3 says we must respond within five days, which is consistent with the FOIL law. So we basically have tried to follow the procedures in FOIL. So if you look at 937.3, yeah. it says we need to respond. But here it says promptly. But promptly for inspection in accordance with subparts 937.3 and 937.4. So again, most of what my understanding is is these regs have been and, and continue to be based on the language that's in the, the it's and FOIL there, as far as the procedure goes. And there is a specific goes. time record. 937.3, we do need to respond within five days. And what's 937.4? Um, and so, what is in four? Four, four just talks about the procedure that we follow. Okay. But so we have to respond within five days. But that means that we could say, for example, someone asked for something that was large, or what often happens because we get we get hundreds of these requests is right when the FDS has come in on May fifteenth, and then when we get the legislative FDSs, we get bombarded with requests. So we might not be able to respond in five days. So I mean, we might not be able to turn over the document so in five why, days. So we respond and we tell them we need more time. Okay, so why can't we change the word promptly to conform? If it's five days, it's five days. Why do we create these, these provisions upon which people can argue about? It says five days, let's say five days, and let's keep it easy and keep it clear. Well, again, we respond within five days to the request, but that doesn't mean we produce the document within That's five days. That's what I'm talking about. Let's get a time period for production. But it depends on the nature of the request. So again, if they're asking us for something while we're getting, you know, hundreds of requests, we need more time. Mo Monica, sometimes we get requests for a lot Monica, of it, yeah. if you look at 937.3C2, um, the receipt you, it, 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 there is a time frame which it has to be reasonable under the circumstances and not more than 20 days after the date of the acknowledgement. So there's a time period there. Or if there's a reason why we can't do it, we still have to give a date certain. So there is, the 20 day, there is a 20 day limit already built in to this, into this process. Um, at least that's the way I, I, I read it. Um, uh, um, and once again, three picks up on that where, as well. Where I'm but would you want? I mean, we could say make the record available for inspection in accordance with subparts three point seven point three and seven point four, and just delete the word promptly. Yeah, I think the clearer the the, the time period is, uh, the better, in my view. But uh, 
But so I think there's a lot of detail in the time period in 937.3 about the procedure. So maybe to, 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 re to resolve your issue with the, the vagueness of the word properly, we just remove it. So we'll make the record available in accordance with 937.3, which has time periods in 937.4. I, I would agree with that because that inserts yet another question. I don't think that deleting that word will change. No. No, no, no. no and we're still bound by the 20-day period. Right. We still have statutory period. Yeah. Exactly. We're, 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 we so, but it will avoid the vagueness, but it will. we're still following the exact same times and procedures. So we just need a motion to move forward on an emergency base and permanent basis as amended. Don't move. Right, before that, <laughs> hold on. Uh, um, I don't have it in front of me, but um, the public access to a uh, substantial basis investigation yep. regarding a legislative, a legislator or a legislative employee. It says, um, in conformance with requirements of Section 89B of the legislative law, I was just trying to pull it up to see what that is. Um, and is that a change from existing practice? It, it is not a change from existing practice. This is what was adopted by this commission in 2012. And 89, hold on, I have the legislative law. Um, oh, I thought I had it. Legislative law, 80, 89B, I believe, is the provision. It's that, 80 points. Yes, that dictates how the substantial base investigation report is made public. Sub B talks about it, and it says not later than 45 yeah, days. Yeah, it's like not later than 45 calendar days after receipt from JCO right. of a SBIR and any supporting documentation. Other, and it goes through the exact time periods that the Legislative Ethics Commission has to follow and how JCO can proceed from there. Yeah, and this has been the procedure we've had since PIRA. So. And we've been following it. Um, uh, we've been following it, and the, the Legislative Ethics Commission has been following it. So there's no, there's no substantive change here. This is the practice we've had for the last five years, and these are the regs as we adopted them in 2012. Right. Does that apply just in the case where there's a finding of a substantial basis, or does it also apply in the case where there's a vote against a, a finding of substantial basis? If there's a vote against the finding of a substantial base and investigation report, that, and, and so the substantial base investigation report doesn't get issued, it doesn't become public. And so these regs wouldn't apply. So it, nine, won't go to the, it won't go to the legislature and it won't become public. So 9414A mm -hmm. only applies to times when there's a vote by the commission that there is a substantial basis. Right. Right. Has found a substantial basis. Right. That's correct. Okay. And if you look at 19, the, the, if, if the you look, report cannot be issued unless the commission votes to issue it. And also, we're bound, Jim, in 941906 deals with, with the issue expressly in terms of um, uh, the actual issuance of an SBIR. Um, uh, it, this has to do with the records available for inspection. Mm -hmm. So it, it talks, it presumes the issuance of it, um, and then also guides the, le the uh, legislature in that as well. So 9416, 94 sub 9 paragraphs, excuse me, subdivision 19, uh, paragraph A, subparagraph 6 deals with, with that issue. Okay. Did someone second the motion? Then I'll second it. Commissioner Yates has seconded the motion, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, all in favor, please. New York City and Buffalo in favor. Albany's in favor. And Commissioner Rosen. Okay. Any opposed? None here, None. Mr. Mm -hmm. Chair. Thank you. Uh, item five, please. Um, the last major item we have for the for our, at least our public section is a proposed advisory opinion dealing with post-employment restrictions. Uh, Keith, are you? Michael Michael Sanders, who is over in New York, will uh, will present and, and talk about what that advisory opinion is about and what it does or tries to do. Thank you, Thank you sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Uh, the proposed advisory opinion is at tab E. Um, we're trying to start to tackle persistent problems that we've encountered in applying the post-employment restrictions. And in this advisory opinion, we address one such issue, which relates to full-time students who also serve as state employees. Our precedent on this issue goes back to advisory opinion number 9101, in which the, our prior agency, the Ethics Commission, recognized that students who come to work for the state are generally not at the root of the problems the post-employment restrictions were intended to address. It noted, for example, that students don't typically form the same type of contacts and associations that state employees employed on a regular basis can develop. Advisory Opinion 9101 concluded that certain students that should not be included within the definition of employee for purposes of Public Officers Law Section 73 and shouldn't be bound by the post-employment restrictions after leaving state service because those restrictions weren't intended to apply to individuals who were primarily students as opposed to being secondarily serving the state in some capacity. Advisory Opinion 9101 set forth four criteria that an individual must meet in order to be deemed primarily a student. These criteria require that the individual must be enrolled as a full-time student and their state work is limited to no more than half time during the academic year and they may work full-time for no more than four months during any school break. And they may not receive any state employee benefits such as medical, retirement, or paid vacation. Pursuant to advisory opinion number 9101, each of these factors must be satisfied and the opinion doesn't allow for flexibility in their consideration or application. While there certainly is value in having the determination turn on an application of objective criteria, in practice we've found that applying these factors has cut it against their purpose and led to unfair results, specific examples of which are discussed in the opinion. So under advisory opinion 9101, a student who undertakes full-time employment with a state agency for one semester in order to fulfill an educational requirement would be deemed primarily a state employee and only secondarily a student because they work full-time during the school year. A student who works for the state in a position that is only available to students would be deemed primarily a state employee upon the automatic accrual of paid leave time. The opinion we are discussing today does two things. First, it provides that the criteria set forth in advisory opinion number 9101 should be applied with reasonable flexibility with due regard for the particular facts and circumstances of each case and other relevant factors. Second, it provides a non-exhaustive sampling of additional factors that may be considered, such as whether the individual state service earned academic credit or otherwise satisfied an educational requirement or was intended to finance the individual's education. Staff believes that this opinion maintains the proper balance between protecting the public's interest, underlying the post-employment restrictions, and avoiding the unintended application of the post-employment restrictions to individuals whose state service is clearly secondary to their educational endeavors. Dan? Uh, Commissioner Jacob, I just speak. I don't understand the last paragraph of the opinion. The opinion until and unless amended or revoked the finding on the commission. In any subsequent proceeding concerning the person who requested it, this is not a requested opinion. Is this, it? this opinion responds to several requests that were okay. made recently. Sorry about that. I, I didn't get that. In your presentation. Any other comments, questions? Uh, yeah. If I can. Commissioner Knopf. Yeah. Uh, so Monica, how many people, how many students does this really apply to that uh, are working for the government? I'm not sure if we know how many, but we've had multiple requests in the last year. We get, I would say, about 20 inquiries a year on this issue. Um, Thank if, you. If, 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 you know, a number of uh, educational programs require the students to get some kind of internship, either for a semester or an entire year. Um, and that, that's the source of many of these inquiries. 
So just for, as an example, a student who, a student in public health who um, takes a required internship with the DOH would then be subject to the two-year bar and not be able to take any public health related job that required her to interact with DOH for two years. Which is a lot of the stuff. So you right. basically are, if, if we don't have the flexibility, we render a lot of students unemployable in the field that they wish to study. So um, I think you said it best when you said if, if, if with the, without the flexibility, the application of these four criteria actually cut against their purpose. Um, because the purpose of this was to recognize that students have different needs, they're in a different position than most state employees, and we want them to be employable. The, the two interests are cutting against each other. And, you know, if somebody works a few days over the criteria, then they're out. And if a student has to accept some of the state benefits because that's the state policy or the agency policy and they don't have a choice, then they're out. And they, they now are bound by the two-year bar, which, again, ends up having the effect of making them unemployable in some instances. Commissioner Yates. Yes. Um, as I understand it, this would apply both to the two-year bar and the lifetime bar for, for matters in which the person was personally involved. Okay. How does that interact with yes. the Section 74 about not revealing confidential information? just wondering about the situation where the students personally involved in the matter acquires confidential information and then what do we say or do or do you want to add something in the at the end of the opinion that makes it clear that 74 still applies uh, assuming it does you don't want, well, in other words, no. you don't want someone who was personally involved, acquired confidential information, even though a student, going out and getting a job immediately by trading on that information. So, um, Commissioner Reese, you raise a, an, inter, an, an issue that is a problem with, um, with, with all employees. 74 only applies while someone's still in state service. Oh. Oh. So, well, while people are subject to post-employment restrictions, um, they're not subject to 74 unless they sign some other kind of agreement with their agency. But 74 only applies to state offices, current state offices and employees. So I'm sympathetic to the problem, and I want to help the students be able to get on with their career, but I'm a little bit cautious. I want to be a little bit cautious about someone being involved in a negotiation, acquiring confidential information, and while they're there, working on their next job. Well, I, I, I would just point out that... Couldn't we deal with that with the, with the discretion, affording the commission discretion? I mean, if, I mean, obviously that would be our interest in, in monitoring what they can do or not do. Um, but right now it's just prohibitive. Um, but if we provide guidelines that, or our internal guidelines are that we don't want students trading on the information that can be reviewed when they submit their information to the commission. So maybe some cautionary language? I don't know. In terms of how you exercise your discretion? I would also just point out that this, this issue that's been raised isn't unique to students. There are multiple instances in which someone could gain confidential information on a specific project or a specific endeavor and not have the contacts necessary with respect to that endeavor to rise to, uh, to, rise to the level where the lifetime bar prohibits that individual's involvement post-employment. So that's a, this, this is an issue that's present in, for every single, potentially every single employee. Um, just because you have confidential information doesn't necessarily mean you would be lifetime barred from activity relating to that confidential information. A lifetime bar is a different analysis. It doesn't begin and end with confidential information. So I, I, I just don't see how this, the adding language here would single out students in a way that is, I think, antithetical to the purposes of the, uh, of the opinion. So I, I just want to, I think there, there's, there's two things I just want to point out. One is the current state of affairs is 9101 is in effect. It has the strict criteria. And if you meet the strict criteria, 
both the two-year bar and lifetime bar do not apply. Um, and so all this is trying to do is, is give us a little bit more flexibility with the criteria. I think that we could, um, we could add something if, if that's necessary to reflect the um, cautionary um, aspects that both Commissioner Yates is, has raised and that Commissioner Smalls has suggested so that, you know, there might be some limitations, for example, on lifetime bar, um, depending on the nature of what you're doing. Lifetime bar would apply if someone has personal and substantial involvement with an issue and then leaves and is going to get compensated to do something related to that particular issue. I, I would imagine most students don't, rate, don't engage in conduct that would rise to the level of a lifetime bar, but there may be some that do. Um. So we could add something to the advisory opinion to reflect that. Um, if, if that's what the commission wants to do. I, I would suggest if we do that, the paragraph to do it in is on page six, beginning the commission now renders its opinion um, that the criteria should be applied with reasonable flexity, uh, flexibility, flexibility, flexibility with due regard to the facts and circumstances of each case and such other relevant factors. And then we have a non-inclusive list of, of factors. Um, and so um, I, I think if, if we're going to, Mod, you know, if we, we modify the draft, that would probably be the place to do it. For example, someone who is working at GOER on intensive, as a student intern working on negotiations, and then uh, as a student, and then goes to work for the union and knows certain things about management strategy, even though the person that was there as a student, uh, those might be the kind of issues that we're talking about that might be a, a lifetime bar if it was the same negotiation. But I think if we're going to modify that, that would be the paragraph to put in some mention uh, of those, of whatever factors we're talking about. It, it could also be along the lines of any engineering student who's working at DOT in a co-op program, for example, from Northeastern, Which they and then goes to work for, uh, for a firm that's bidding on that, uh, on that project that the, that the the engine now engineer worked on it as an intern. So we could certainly add something to the factors that includes the concepts behind the lifetime bar. So personal and substantial involvement in particular matter yep. or transaction, um, which may require some limitation in their post-employment activities. And that would still allow the flexibility that we think was behind 9101 um, would allow us to, to, to meet the purpose um, of recognizing the students are different, but protect the interests that um, the statute and Commissioner Yates have, have, have raised. Um, so the commission could, you know, ad adopt the advisory opinion with this as amended, um, and if anyone wants to see it, we could always circulate it um, before we make it public just to tweak the language. I had one question, too, um, the, and I'm all in favor of increasing flexibility. On page six, the one uh, criteria was intended to finance the individual's education. I'm just curious on what the thinking was on that, because it would seem to me that in 99% of cases, um, a student's employment would would go toward financing their education. Are any of them required as part of the grant? So as part we of did have one case where um, the job was written. We did have one case where the job was required as part of uh, a grant from the Veterans Administration. Okay. Then if there's opportunity for people, if we have enough here, that we go to take both employees. Yeah. Yeah. And again, I would just I would just add it would never you know it's not about one particular factor. It's looking at the balance of the factors and really making the determination whether this person is actually more of a student than an employee. Sure. Right, so I, I'm just trying to get understand the, con the only wait. I'm just trying to understand the contours here of this of of the proposal in which some lifetime bar factors would be included here. So would the result be that the commission that there, there would be a, like an informal opinion issue that said you, you're, you're not covered, you're not an employee for the purposes of the two-year bar, but you're an employee for the purposes of the lifetime bar? Like that doesn't seem to be, that, uh, I, I'm, not, I'm, I'm a little, 
I, mean, I, think, I, I, I think that the difference there is lifetime bar is issue centered, two year bar is institutional. Right, right. So, but, so but, we would, but the threshold issue here is whether you're even covered by these statutes. Right, that's that's what these criteria go to is whether you're covered. Whether you're an employee or you're not. Whether you're an employee or you're, employee or you're not. And if you're an employee, you're in for everything. So I don't know if the commission would even have the authority to, to say that you, you are lifetime barred in some met you the lifetime bar applies to you as a general principle and, and we're we're going to see if it actually its specific application is warranted in this instance, but the two year bar doesn't apply to you. I don't think the yeah. commission can do that. My my point wasn't with the Pizza. lifetime bar. My point was with use of confidential no. information. So all I'm saying is I, I agree there should be a lot of flexibility. It should be left to discretion, a rule of reason. I'm fine with all of that. I'm just saying one of the factors that we ought to reserve to ourselves as a factor to take into account is whether or not the person is trading on confidential information. That's all. I'm not. I, I, other people started talking about the lifetime bar. That wasn't my my issue. Yeah. But having Sarah, uh, Michael Sand wants to address oh, okay. uh, the issues raised by Commissioner Cohen and Yates. Yeah, just one point I wanted to make. One of the factors listed on, on page six to be considered is, what, is whether the student functions in a role that was substantially the same as other state employees. So if, if a student were to say be heavily involved in negotiations at Goer, most likely that individual was functioning in a role substantially the same as other state employees, which would dictate against finding them being primarily a student. They would there be primarily a state employee, and the post-employment restrictions would apply. I just want to, um, just for context, uh, remind uh, the commission that we're talking about students who are generally at the beginning of their careers. Um, and may not even have a career, uh, whereas our regulations are structured to um, monitor, monitor and hold accountable professionals um, that are making money, um, generally lobbying state agencies. And it just seems a little bit like we're losing sight um, of uh, just proportion by focusing this much on students. I agree that we should be in a position where we can evaluate and um, judge whether a student is somehow trying to um, leverage or take advantage of their state service, which by, by nature of them being a student will be um, relatively brief. Um, but, you know, we're not talking about a 55-year-old lobbyist for a Fortune 500 company, we're talking about a 21-year-old at a state university that got, you know, an internship at a state agency, and we just need to keep that in perspective while we're debating, um, you know, these restrictions on young people that, you know, haven't even started their careers yet. So I think we need the discretion for the agency to make sure there's no abuse. Um, but other than that, I, I, I just think this is a little a little um, overzealous with respect to 21-year-olds uh, um, that are full-time students that may have an internship at an agency. I move to adopt the opinion. I second. Thank you. All in favor. So, um, All in favor, please. Okay. Yeah, wait, 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 wait. Okay. Hi. New York City in favor. Uh, what are we, is, uh, Buffalo in favor, and the chair is in favor. Is this opposed. just just to clarify? This is to the the opinion or the opinion as amended. What is the, the that, that was the question that had been raised? I, my my motion is to adopt the opinion as it's is. written. Okay. As, There's that. The, uh, on the motion, Mr. On the motion, Mr. Chairman, a question uh, is written. Is it the prerogative of the commission to entertain each case on its own terms and its own circumstances and make a determination? Is that what is contemplated here? Um, <laughs> sorry, so uh, just to, Commissioner Levine, if you could just repeat that a little louder or, or lean forward. I, th I think what you said is it will be the prerogative of the commission to consider the facts and circumstances of each case. Yes. 
Second um, time in the meeting. And, you and so I, I just want to, you know, we I. expect that we will continue to get informal requests of staff um, where people will present the facts and circumstances and staff will provide, you know, informal opinions and guidance as to whether or not that person qualifies as a student and therefore would not be subject to the post employment restriction. Well, on the follow up, Madam General Counsel. If an informal opinion is rendered by the staff and the student is looking for recourse, is there an appeal to us? Yes. Always. Ask for an appeal. Always. Ask for and formal. then on the, Always. On um, the appeal. Anyone who gets informal guidance from us can appeal to the full committee. And then on the appeal, we have the widest latitude to consider the particular facts and circumstances, correct? Yes. Thank you. With this opinion. Okay, okay let's, so let's go back here for a second. Right? We had a motion to uh, adopt these as written, seconded, and voted on. I didn't hear any uh, against. I'm opposed. Uh, but, okay. Commissioner yeah. Yates in the negative. Did all of Albany vote yet? Did all of Albany vote? No. That's, I think, um, we, didn't get the we, we didn't get the Albany vote. Did Albany vote, revote, please? Yes. All right, all in favor, please. Okay, you can all be voted. Yes, all in favor of adopting the opinion as written. New York City, Buffalo, and the chair is in favor. We have commissioners uh, in favor, commissioners McAuliffe, Cohn, Sample, Deering, and Levine in the affirmative. All right, and only Commissioner Yates is opposed? N no, we have another commissioner sitting here. <laughs> uh, I think okay. in opposition. Yeah. Commissioners Yates and Weissman uh, in, in our nays. Okay. All right. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yes. The, the, it, it carries. Yep. Okay. By a vote of nine to. Nine to two. Okay. Okay. That's item six. Any new and other business? I do. I don't see any new business being raised by by the folks here in Albany, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you. Uh, at this point, then, that concludes our, our public session. I need a motion to enter into executive session, please. So moved. Thank you. Second. Second. Commissioner Yates has seconded that. That's what All okay, favor. so that was McAuliffe and Yates, is that correct? Yes. Correct, Monica, yes. Okay, and favor. And favor. Well, we'll go with executive session. New York City, Albany, the Chair, Mr. Noss. <coughs> He's in favor. Yep. Albany, yes. Okay. Thank you. So we're we're off yes. to the negative side right now. Thanks, everybody. Stand by. Tell me when Monica's back in the room, please. I'm here. I'm here. Okay, Monica, you want to tell me what I'm saying? Mr. Chair, we're back in public session. Oh. Well. Chair, would you like me to just report on what we did in the public session? Please, if you wouldn't mind. Okay, sure. Um, we did, uh, the commission discussed some litigation matters, commenced an investigation, and authorized some action with respect to other investigative matters, and discussed some investigative matters. Um, uh, um, and, and that was it. Okay, thank you. Uh, now we just need motion to adjourn. So moved. <laughs> Second. Thank you. Second. <laughs> you also all in favor of adjourning. We should be happy when you get there. <laughs> the George. New York CNN. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 where is where is home? Well, okay. no, we live in Soho, but we have a house in Lennox, and the Thanks Saturday everybody. Most of my time. Yeah. Uh, so, we'll